I've come here to really address three issues. I'll start with the main issue, which has been on the minds of a lot of people and uh, taking up a lot of our news cycle within the last few days in particular. That's the situation with respect to our registration of Venezuelans and how we as a Trinidadian population deal with our brothers and sisters from Venezuela as they make their way to our shores. First of all, as we had announced as a government a few weeks ago, we are commencing a registration process and I'm happy to say that we will be keeping with the timetable of that registration process starting on the 31st of May, which is next week, Friday, and finishing on the 14th of June. So the registration of all Venezuelans in Trinidad and Tobago will be taking place from the 31st of May to the 14th of June. We have reduced the number of registration centers because of course as we get into the planning and the rollout and the implementation of the logistics of it and what is necessary from a hardware point of view, a body's point of view, and also quite frankly from a national security point of view, being able to have sufficient measures in place to ensure that we keep persons safe, etc. We've gone with three registration centers. One in Port of Spain, which will be at the Queen's Park Oval. The one in San Fernando would be at the Chivas Banquet Hall, Duncan Street, San Fernando. And then the one in Tobago will be at the Caroline Building, Wilson Road, Scarborough. So we are going with three registration centers come the 31st of May until the 14th of June. In the Port of Spain, in Port of Spain, it will be the Queen's Park Oval in San Fernando, Achievers Banquet Hall on Duncan Street, and then in Tobago, the Caroline Building, Wilson Road, Scarborough, Tobago. I am very happy to say that we've had a tremendous response from the public and from persons willing to assist with interpreters. We actually are oversubscribed with the number of persons who are coming forward to interpret for us during this registration process. That is something that is better. It's better we have more than we have less. Just to briefly walk you through what we expect of this registration process. First of all, I re-emphasize that whether Venezuelans are here legally or illegally, they are to participate in the registration process. We are asking that all Venezuelans in Trinidad and Tobago during this period, whether you're here legally or illegally, you participate in the registration process. We are going to have an online registration as part of the process. So we're asking persons to go online. The communications plan will be launched after this press conference and they will be, we will begin to put out the information of the online registration process where you go, you fill out the forms. We're asking that persons, as many as possible, fill out these forms beforehand. Each form is going to have a personal identification number that is unique to the form. The form is a bilingual form in both English and in Spanish. These forms immediately go into our database. At each of these three registration centers, we are also going to have computer terminals with interpreters and persons to assist with Venezuelans who turn up to register at these registration posts, outposts as we call them. So these registration posts, these centers, we will also have the online facility to allow persons to register. Once you've registered these online forms, you then come forward as part of the process. Of course, the registration centers can only take a certain number of persons on a daily basis. So what we will be doing is trying to manage that process. No one is going to be turned away. Once you've registered, as I say, you get your unique, form, your unique identification on your form and as part of the registration process that you've begun. We will then tell persons when to come, when we can accommodate them, etc. But the point is, whether you're here illegally or legally, you can register and we want everyone to register. Now the consequence, I'll jump straight to the consequence to try and help persons understand why they have to register. The consequence of not registering. So come the 15th of June, what is going to happen to persons who have not taken part in this registration process is we revert back to the law and the enforcement of the law as it currently stands. So please, Venezuelans who are looking on and listening, do not listen to anyone trying to convince you not to participate in the registration exercise. We understand that there are certain persons trying to convince Venezuelans 
not to participate in the registration exercise. There's some nefarious reason why we, the government of Trinidad and Tobago, want you registered. Completely untrue. We're asking you to register. So we, the government of Trinidad and Tobago, and the people in Trinidad and Tobago know exactly who is in Trinidad, who are our Venezuelan brothers and sisters and children that are here. The registration forms allow for the registration of children. Back to the registration process. Once there's been this registration online, which just means on the computer, we then take you through to a desk where there will be immigration officers, interpreters, etc., to now do a quick verification of the the information to take your fingerprints, your biometrics via your fingerprints, and to take photographs of you. Everyone who's part of the registration process will be registered that way, even the children. At the end of the registration, and also in that registration process, the Ministry of Health is partnering with us. We're trying to have as many bilingual doctors and nurses there. We will also have interpreters as well, just to do a quick health scan to understand and to make sure that there, there are not any issues from a health perspective that we need to deal with. At the end of that registration process, everyone will be given a receipt. This receipt will then entitle them, once we've completed the exercise on our end in the back room, for a registration card. There are security features of these registration cards. Registration cards will only be given to Venezuelans who have registered in the process above the age of 16. So children under the age of 16, you'll be registered, we'll have, you in your, uh, we'll have them in our database, but they will not be provided with this, this registration card. And just to put an end, you all would recall when we announced this plan, the political mischief of others suggesting that this registration process had something to do with elections. Again, completely untrue. I just put that on the record because I expect the mischief makers to start to bombard us very soon with all sorts of innuendos and truths, misrepresentations. At the end of the registration process, the, but not on the same day, those who have registered above 16 will get registration cards. These registration cards will have security features. They will have security features. We are also intending that there be a strip on these registration cards that immigration can then utilize with the cards on their passport scanners that would then, the same way we have the, on our passports, the strips on our passport that when they scan your passport, certain information comes up. These cards will also have information that triggers it back to the database so we know who you are. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and our intelligence services have been getting information from Interpol and other agencies including some of our allied countries with the contacts so that we have a red flag list of anybody who comes up as a criminal in part of this process. Again, to the Venezuelans who are here between the 31st of May and the 14th of June in this registration process, whether you're here legally or illegally, please come forward and register. The ultimate proviso to all of this, and this remains the government's position and it remains the position of national security. Anyone, any individual who's engaged in criminal activity, they will be deported. I had a meeting a few weeks ago with the UNHCR representatives and the IOM representatives, and I made it very clear because they have a process where they're registering as well, which is completely separate to this government's registration process. I made it very clear that regardless of whether persons have a certificate from UNHCR through Living Waters or any other methodology, if they participate in criminality, we will deport them. Ultimately, the government's first priority is to the safety and security of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And that is something we're very, very clear about. This is a humanitarian effort by us because our neighbors are coming across, but we are not going to tell, tolerate any criminality. The other point is at the end of the registration process, when these persons are registered and they get their cards, they are going to be entitled to work for a year. In six months' time, persons will have to come back in, check in with immigration, we'll do a comparison of records. Now this card is not a get out of jail card. 
this registration card is not a, you are entitled to be in Trinidad and break the law. Even if persons have gone through the registration process, get their registration card, and then engage in criminal activity, again, as the Minister of National Security, I will deport you. I have signed a number of deportation orders over the last few weeks, probably somewhere between, up around 10, for those who have been convicted of criminal activity in Trinidad and Tobago. I have also had discussions with the Minister of Works and Transport, with the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard, with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and Prison Service for how it is that we may be able to deport persons or remove persons going forward in the future. This registration process is going to take place. We're asking for the assistance of all. It is going to present its opportunities and difficulties as well. We are doing all that we can to ensure that it's done in a timely fashion and an orderly manner. We have done a lot of preparation and it will continue to do our preparation up to the last minute and we will deal with things as they come at us. The position of Trinidad and Tobago remains, as I had announced post-cabinet a few weeks ago, the Venezuelans who are here would be allowed a certain, up to a certain level of medical care, which is basically the emergency medical care in our health systems. Anything other than that, it will have to be paid for. There is no guarantee of educational um, services being provided because, of course, again, our first priority is the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Fortunately, there have been a lot of private sector help. I've seen certain churches and other religious bodies assisting the Venezuelan people with education, etc. The Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard has been doing yeoman service, the men and women in the Coast Guard, over the past few weeks in attempting to patrol our border, in patrolling our borders and in attempting to keep persons who are illegal from coming into our waters and, and then landing on the shores of Trinidad and Tobago. As we are all aware, it is virtually impossible to throw a complete blanket and a fence, a virtual fence, and block everyone from coming in. So we have had episodes as we've had this week where persons have made it to the shores of Trinidad and Tobago, etc. At the end of the day, the government has taken a decision. We are not going to be anything other than humanitarian at this stage and until the completion of the registration process. So those persons who are here, register. Immigration will issue. We've had discussions. In fact, I've just come here, and I should have said this at the outset, I've just come here from a National Security Council meeting where we had present, including the ministers who are members of the National Security Council, chaired by the Honorable Prime Minister. We had the Commissioner of Police present, the Director of the SSA present, the Commissioner of Prisons present, the Chief Immigration Officer and Deputy Chief Immigration Officer president, the, com the Chief of Defense staff present. And that meeting was really to pull everyone together and to ensure that at the government level, my colleagues who sit on the National Security Council and the chairmanship of the Prime Minister and the heads of those various divisions are all on the same page as we get closer to this exercise taking place. And then also that we are aware of how we will be dealing with any areas of illegality post the exercise or even whilst the exercise is going on. I cannot overemphasize the position that if persons are engaged in criminality, we will, how we will deal with you. That was made very clear to the heads of division. We have also been working with the Venezuelan authorities to be able to do the due diligence exercise. So for example, the 93 persons that were picked up earlier this week down in the south of Trinidad, there were some of them who were undocumented. Every Venezuelan has a particular PIN ID number assigned to them. So one of the things that we were able to do coming out of that exercise is when persons identify themselves by name, we were able to contact the Venezuelan authorities to then do a verification as to whether that name came up to be the person that the person was claiming to be. So that system is working and we will be tapping into that system as we go forward in this registration exercise. We have also been able to make contact on my direction yesterday 
our intelligence services and our defense force services with the Venezuelan authorities and the Guardio Nacional has also been requested, and they have been doing it, but they've also been requested to see what extra resources they can put up to assist in the prevention of people leaving Venezuela with the intent of illegally coming into Trinidad and Tobago. So between the Guardio Nacional and the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard, we're doing our best to man the, um, the borders. There was a recent incident that has been reported in the media about an allegation that a vessel carrying Venezuelans sank and a certain individual being picked up and that is a fact. He was picked up by a private marine vessel that was heading up to Grenada. And there were claims coming out of that that he was the, uh, the pilot of the boat. He was the person the driving the boat that sank. I want to inform the people of Trinidad and Tobago that that individual who was taken to Grenada, when Grenada did the same exercise and our intelligence services did the same exercise of now identifying that person he turned out to be a person of a criminal background and a person who engages in human trafficking. As soon as that was found out, the individual absconded from the hospital in Grenada. So I want you all to understand the types of individuals that are finding themselves in these systems. This is a person who is wanted in Venezuela for engaging in human trafficking. As soon as we became aware of that, he absented himself from the hospital in Grenada and has gone missing. These are the types of individuals that we as law enforcement have to deal with. We are not going to tolerate the criminal rings that we know exist that are engaging in human trafficking between Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela. We are not, we do know that there are persons in Venezuela with links in Trinidad that are engaging in this human trafficking, engaging in taking persons' monies and then telling them they'll take them to Trinidad and then all sorts of things unfortunately happen to persons when they come to Trinidad illegally. We are telling our Venezuelan brothers and sisters, don't fall prey to that. They are legal ports of entry. At the end of the day, we will be going after those engaged in human trafficking both those, especially those engaged in human trafficking locally here in Trinidad and Tobago. You all can expect to see action being taken against those who are exploiting Venezuelans and others in prostitution and in other very detrimental areas to our society of Trinidad and Tobago. We have consistently said that no one is above the law. We are currently pursuing investigations in those areas. There are certain international bodies that get involved in these types of situations. So for example, one of them is the UNHCR. Yesterday, the UNHCR took a decision to declare Venezuela a territory where persons are leaving as refugees. At the end of the day, Trinidad and Tobago continues to respect its international treaty obligations. But I am saying here very clearly that this government, as you heard the Prime Minister say yesterday, at the end of the day, this government is very clear that its first mandate and its first priority to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And at the end of the day, we are small, as the Prime Minister described, we are small, land space compared to a very big land space, 1.3 million people compared to 33 million people. At the end of the day, we will do what we have to do to protect the people of Trinidad and Tobago whilst observing our international obligations. These bodies that provide the services under the umbrella of their international obligations and UNHCR, etc., they have a process where they should be taking persons who they've offered asylum, etc., to, to other countries and other more developed countries that have more facilities, more resources, etc. If they want to continue in that type of exercise, we look forward to them 
actually carrying through to the end of their obligation. It is very easy to give a person a piece of paper and say that's a certificate that you can remain in Trinidad and Tobago. But the end of the process is not a process that we're seeing in the continuation of their obligations or the fulfillment of their obligations in taking persons now to more developed countries that may be better suited to house them. At the end of the day, the government will do what it needs to do to protect our sovereignty and to ensure that we protect the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I think basically at this stage, those are, that's what I wanted to say about Venezuela and the registration process that will end on the 14th. It is a fluid process, people. There is absolutely nothing, I mean, other countries have faced this. You would have seen Peru as a country that initially was taking in droves of people and then they reached a point where they said our resources cannot handle anymore and Peru within the last few days has actually deported Venezuelans back to Venezuela. That is an example. Colombia. Colombia is now currently under strain of what they, of, of the Venezuelan situation even though they may have international help. At the end of the day, Trinidad and Tobago and the government are very aware of what our resources are and our limited resources. We are going to do the huma humane thing, which is what we're doing now. We're offering this registration process, which is mandatory, whether you're here legally or illegally, and then we're offering that you can work legally for a year. The working, being permitted to work legally for a year, of course, is part of it is allows people to earn a living. The other part is we're trying to combat any exploitation of Venezuelans by those disingenuous and criminal elements in our society who would be holding it over persons that you're here illegally and if you don't do what I tell you, I will report you to the, the law enforcement officials. I'll take some questions. I'll take questions on the Venezuelan exercise after. There are two other issues that I'd like to just briefly touch on here today. One is to warn the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago that social media continues to be used by persons in our society, unfortunately, to cause or attempt to cause panic. <clears throat> so for example, this morning I had a number of citizens forwarding to me photographs claiming these were pictures of Venezuelans and Venezuelan women who had been scarred and who had big injuries to themselves, etc., and saying this is the type of criminality here in Trinidad and Tobago. The first point is, be aware that all that circulates on social media may not be true. There's a verification exercise that needs to be undergone, but by the time that exercise is completed, the horse has bolted, people are panicking. Citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, those who do not have our best interests at heart, are going to be trying to create panic. The last thing we want to do is to turn on anyone. So let us be aware of it. At the end of the day, I can assure you that the law enforcement personnel in Trinidad and Tobago at the highest levels as well as our intelligence services take everything seriously. And if we believe there's a threat or if we believe there's something you need to be alerted to, we are very transparent and we come forward and do it and we tell you. Don't fall prey to those who are trying to cause discord, disarray, panic in Trinidad and Tobago by circulating fake stuff via social media. The other one is a more specific incident that I was once again very disheartened to have to face as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago this morning and then as the, responsible, the minister responsible for national security. Very early, well, first of all, I was given a briefing last night in an informal manner, as I've told you all before, I'm constantly being briefed via communications as to what is going on in the realm of national security. One of the things that was sent to me last night is there was this threat in inverted commas of a bomb scare to a particular school in Port of Spain, but it had been investigated um, the necessary precautions were being put in place. There are a lot of people, unfortunately, in our society who think it's a great prank to call in bomb scares, to send threats to persons, etc. I mean, we've been experiencing this from time immemorial. This particular one came across the radar screen, 
And as is done, protocols were put in place, law enforcement was informed, intelligence were informed, checks were carried out, persons who needed to be informed were informed, etc. Lo and behold, this morning, my phone was bombarded by the time I got up by concerned citizens of a post by an opposition member. The post from the UNC opposition went from initially being a photograph of an email suggesting that if a certain sum of money wasn't paid, a student would be given a bomb to take to school, etc., in a particular school in Port of Spain. This UNC operative and member is the person who put that out in the public domain. Not being satisfied with that, this UNC opposition member then went further and began posting and spreading, because he has a methodology of spreading it. And as I look around, I'm sure many of you members of the media are part of his mailing list. He then began to spread all sorts of messages on social media that could only be designed to cause panic and to instill fear and to have a disaster for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, this is the United National Congress's playbook. This is what the opposition is doing through this person. He even went so far as to say in one of his posts that they're targeting Catholic schools. I denounce this as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. I denounce this in the strongest possible terms. This is extremely irresponsible. In fact, I saw the commissioner of police, the, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service put out uh, a warning about it or a press release about what had to happen. All of the schools were searched. All were found to be safe. But what the UNC opposition did in the interim was sought to create a sense of panic amongst our students or young people in Trinidad and Tobago and their parents. That is extremely irresponsible. So whilst we in law enforcement, we in national security were following protocols and doing what needed to be done, they believed that it was an opportune moment to try and create panic in Trinidad and Tobago. This UNC operative who does this constantly sought, and the only reason he could have sought to do this was to create a sense of panic. Because any responsible person would contact law enforcement and say, look, I've been provided with this. You all need to investigate it. We are in the middle of exams at all of these schools, and exams that can determine the life and the future of our students in Trinidad and Tobago. As a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, I denounce this behavior by the individual and by the opposition party. As the Minister of National Security, I draw the public's attention to this continued type of behavior. It is a destructive behavior that is a strategy to create a sense of fear amongst the population of Trinidad and Tobago. And it is something that should not be tolerated. Thank you all very much. At this stage, I'll take some questions. <clears throat> With him, with him specifically, he's a human trafficker. I don't have a legal definition in front of me on internationally accepted legal definition of a human trafficker. He has a criminal record for human trafficking. He's wanted for human trafficking. What I understand that to mean is he's engaging in an illegal activity. I don't quite frankly see the, the, the great difference between the two because trafficking persons is illegal. So if you are bringing persons in, and if you want to call them migrant, what, what did you call it? What was the term? Just Migrant smuggling. You're suggesting there's some differentiation. You're bringing in migrants illegally. 
Once you're bringing in migrants illegally, that's trafficking in humans. If you're saying that the person himself is trafficking in humans in terms of there's an end product of putting them in prostitution or um, illegal labor and that type of thing, at this stage, I haven't drawn any differentiation between the two. or paying for it. Okay, but, but even in those instances, very frequently, what you find is persons being told, look, I have jobs for you in, for example, Trinidad. There are a number of jobs in a restaurant or there are a number of jobs in the hospital or wh whatever it is. And if you pay me a sum of money, I will take you across there and get it. So the people would have participated in that consensually. Of course, the whole activity is illegal because they're not entering through a legal port, they haven't applied for work permits, they haven't done what needs to be done legally. Right? But at this stage, the information provided to me is the gentleman is wanted for human trafficking. Uh, you will just pass the, the mic. There's another one, yeah. Yeah, um, the, I'm uh, wondering about the cost of this um, the mig migrant registration process. The staffing, if it's existing staff or other people coming, like you said, some interpreters, and also whether international agencies who, who say all these wonderful things are giving any financial assistance. <clears throat> no international agency is giving any financial assistance. We have collaborated with the IOM from a software perspective and assistance with software for the registration process. They have also provided expertise when we were in the planning stage because they have conducted or assisted in these exercises, for example, in Colombia and other places. No financial assistance. We're not accepting financial assistance from any country or international body. The cost that cabinet had approved, the budget that cabinet had approved was $5 million. But at the end of the day, it is fluid. As I just told the National Security Council, this is something that is fluid. It is something that you are going to come across uncatered um, instances that contingent, excuse, contingencies may not have catered for. The, we have had to hire persons on a temporary basis because we have interpreters, but we also have, I don't know what's the term we use for them, but basically persons to assist in the registration process. And they will be per performing different um, tasks, persons assisting in directing people where to go, persons assisting in data entry, and these types of things. The main part of the registration exercise is being driven, and uh, uh, responsibility falls with immigration. Immigration, of course, this falls in law under immigration. They also have a lot of expertise and this type of thing. Fortunately, the immigration IT department have been great. They have been able to work the, the software and when process right now of testing the hardware and this type of thing. So I don't have a cost that when the exercise is completed, we will be happy to give what the final cost has been. But at this stage, it is a moving target. Wanted to come out, Jordan, from CNC3, wanted to get a better understanding of the reduction from four into. to three registration centers. So from five to three. Five to three. So you have Tobago, San Fernando, and Port, Port of Spain. Spain. But doesn't that create a situation where it may be difficult for certain people to register, um, depending on where they're coming from? A lot of them already face issues with uh, money, transportation, and so on. The answer is, from a logistics point of view and from a security point of view, and just uh, being able to manage the registration centers, we could not go with more than three. Just the amount of bodies you have, the, the, the places, and the size. So that is what drove that decision. At the end of the day, my honest belief and listening to immigration, and they're the ones who are dealing with the persons on the ground for months now, people will make their way to where they need to make their way for registration. So one of the discussions we had with the whole online service, for example, is would they have access to computers, etc. <coughs> there is a huge Venezuelan network in Trinidad right now. They look out for each other, etc. They are going to make their ways to the registration centers. I have no doubt about that. On, on a security issue, you spoke, you said 10 deportation orders. Um, were around filed, 10, around yeah. 10 in the I've last, signed. A um, couple weeks, weeks or yeah. So, right? um, that number seems very small. So uh, the question is, you say, you know, there will be an enforcement of the law, but it doesn't appear right now that there seems to be strict enforcement of the law. Um, so is it a hollow threat per se? And what mm. will happen? Is it that there will be a ramping up of um, security measures during or after <coughs> this registration process? 
after, definitely. The deportations come on the back end of conviction. All right, so they've been convicted as criminals. So by definition, that reduces the number and you're waiting for the conviction. Under the immigration law, however, in our discussions and our looking at it, there are other methodologies available. Also, as a minister of national security, if something poses a threat, a national security threat to Trinidad and Tobago, I do have the right to remove them from Trinidad and Tobago. As I told the UNHCR and the IOM, I am not going to wait necessarily for the completion and for a conviction. If our intelligence agencies come to me, the commissioner of police, the commissioner of prisons, chief of defense staff, and they come and say, this is what we have on individual X. Individual X poses a risk to national security in Trinidad and Tobago. I am prepared in those circumstances to exercise my discretion to say you are no longer welcome in Trinidad and Tobago. You're posing a risk to the security of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago and to have them removed from Trinidad.